Uh, hello, everybody. So, so yeah, I, today I want to talk to you about deep learning for everybody. In fact, that was a great segue because, uh, you know, essentially everybody communicates in natural language, but also understands and walks around in a visual world. So we better build AI algorithms that understand how meaning comes about in both language and visual input. And I will walk you through a couple of interesting applications in natural language processing and computer vision, as well as uh, multimodal applications where both of those are combined. And instead of only focusing on slides, I will try mostly to work uh, off of demos. So uh, let's get started with the first demo, uh, which is sentiment. So sentiment analysis is one of the few NLP applications and classifiers that is broadly useful across you know, different verticals, different industries, if you do it right. So here I have a very simple example, like I enjoy this summit. So that is a very simple sentence, and um, you know, we can classify that correctly. Um, however, when it gets a little harder, oops. Can people still read this? Um, when you actually have you know, some conflicting things or you have negation. So here we see the output of a recursive neural network architecture, something I uh, worked on during my PhD at Stanford and we now have uh, inside the company at MetaMind uh, improved even further. And you can see here that you know, there are things where you may have some you know, positive words like awesome and some negative words like stupid, but it really depends on how the sentence is composed to really understand and correctly classify this. So here you see that something is actually not stupid, so that becomes mostly neutral, just being not stupid isn't really that positive. But once you say it was quite awesome, it actually realizes, okay, overall the sentence is very positive. This model uh, pushed the state of the art on a data set that for many years had, uh, had a maximum accuracy of or lower than 80%. Uh, and actually pushed it to 86 or 87 uh, percent now. And it's really those you know, extra percentages where you can't just get away with doing a simple averaging of the words or simple machine learning methods where you try to sit down and come up with all the ways, you know, write regular expressions and come up with all the ways you could negate a sentence or negate something positive or you know, negate something negative too. So here we see an interesting uh, linguistic example where you have a so-called contrastive conjunction. That's uh, the word but, for instance. So here you say, the first 30 minutes were boring, but by the end, I really enjoyed the movie. And so now, this is actually an overall very positive uh, statement about the movie. So you have here basically these x but y constructions, and the model learns that you have to really focus on what comes after the but instead of what comes before it when you want to understand the whole sentence. But you, know, you could say that sentiment analysis uh, compared to some other task in NLP is still a reasonably easy task. So let's look at question answering, which is something that you know, IBM had spent millions of dollars on in the Watson system. And uh, I show you here the output of a paper that uh, a grad student together with a couple of collaborators, collaborators and me worked on. So here you have a couple of facts about, um, in this case, an author. Does anybody know who that author is? We have a very technical crowd, so I don't expect uh, that many people to know this. Uh, all right, very good, excellent. Uh, so that is exactly right. What's amazing is that we've been able to solve this kind of tough question answering problem where you had you know, basically lots of arbitrary facts, lots of trivia facts with a simple, again, recursive neural network. And what's even more exciting is that neural network can now sort of automatically uh, save facts about specific entities uh, like people or locations or specific battles and so on in a continuous vector space, which is something that a lot of people in natural language processing uh, struggled with uh, for a long time. So here we see a visualization that basically put uh, you know, Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter, for instance, into a very close, uh, the same, same, same area of the vector space. What's even more amazing is that you know, unlike IBM that used, I think, more, more traditional machine learning techniques and had to you know, have a very large team in a very long uh, cycle, this one grad student with some collaborators at the university was able to essentially also beat humans in these trivia competitions with a single neural network architecture. Um, this worked especially well in history. Uh, however, for literature, it was still harder, and only in some cases the model beat humans. In fact, this is kind of understandable in the sense that we didn't actually give the model all the books. We gave it Wikipedia articles, and we gave it some training corpus, but we didn't let it read all the books, so it's hard for it to 
know the plot of all these different uh, books that people had written. But for history, again, you know, the model can already outperform. And I think a lot of times when you look into um, you know, industry and like, see what kinds of questions people ask about you know, systems or in customer relationship, management system, customer service, they're probably less literary and more sort of historical and fact-based. All right, so I mentioned that we don't just want to understand language by itself, but we also want to have systems that understand the visual world. And ideally, we actually have systems that combine both of these worlds and can understand how they are related. So here uh, we have a paper from two years ago um, that I published at Stanford, and we now uh, can also improve the research um, at MetaMind, where we essentially map sentences and images into the same vector space, and now we can look up one from the other. And instead of just showing that to you in theory, let me show you uh, a live demo of this. So here uh, we have the word bird, and as I type in bird, it basically looks at just the pixels of the images, uh, it uses deep learning on both the image and the text side, and just from the pixels is now showing me images that are close to the vector representation of bird. So again, this is not just like Google image search that looks at the text around the image, but it just looks at the pixels and looks at the word. So I type in bird, and once I change bird to birds, it doesn't just show me pictures of a single bird now, but it actually focuses on images where you show multiple birds. So it actually has some understanding of plurality. So now I can say birds on water, and it actually will show me mostly pictures of birds on water, and not just, um, you know, some random kinds of birds. So it has some idea of how you compose these words into the meaning, into a visual meaning. You can also say birds and trees, for instance, uh, and it you know, tries to find the few images uh, in the data set of birds and trees. Um, and you can, you, know, you can say just horse, and you can even say horse with bald man, and it will actually find that one image in the test set that includes um, you know, a picture of a horse with a bald man next to it. So we basically have been able, and even, um, even more abstract things like people having fun uh, are things that you, know, you can try to retrieve uh, now, not just from you know, having had to annotate it, but if they're just lying on your, your desktop or you, you know, uh, haven't had the time to annotate all of your images, it will still find pictures with sort of more abstract concepts. All right. Um, we don't, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to uh, really uh, analyze how well these systems work with sentences, because sentences are quite, um, uh, quite uh, subjective. So what we do instead is we can look at what standard, uh, you know, benchmarks uh, do on, uh, on ImageNet. I'm sure most of you are familiar with ImageNet. It's sort of the de facto standard for evaluating uh, the performance of image classification systems. And here uh, we have an example of uh, what the system would do, um, our system would do when you give it different kinds of images. So this supports a thousand classes, and to the best of our knowledge, there's now only, uh, we're now at the level that Google had uh, with their system when they won the competition last year. So we're at 93.3, top 5% accuracy, and building our entirely own system that is also a lot faster and doesn't require um, as much computation and could actually be deployed in practice. And uh, I think now, though, we're not the state of the art because just two weeks ago or so, Baidu uh, came out with a paper using a very large GPU cluster and got to, I think, around 94. So we're now second in the world, but unlike these large companies, we'll actually let you use this technology and uh, play around with it. In case you, know, you want to have your more working in a specific domain, you might want to use instead a specific classifier. So maybe you're in the food business and you want to have a food classifier. Well, we can very easily just throw um, our general system onto a specific data set uh, like food and then basically classify different, different food items and you know, create a very large data set uh, where we can classify all these different food items. But sometimes you might say, well, I don't want to go through this loop with you and with an expert. I actually just want to be able to train this myself. And when I said deep learning for everybody, I feel like that is only true once anybody who knows how to drag and drop and use a web browser can use it. And that's essentially what we've uh, accomplished once we launched the company last month, uh, which is 
an interface that is extremely easy to use and lets you basically uh, create your own classifier. So what you see here is our, our interface. Um, so let's say, for instance, my food classifier didn't really um, uh, support various types of cookies. Um, it only you know, had a general cookie classifier, but now I want to distinguish between chocolate chip cookies and raisin oatmeal cookies. So I just give it uh, a name. I can make this data set and or classifier private, so I don't have to share it with everybody. And now I can just go and look at just oh, a couple of images here, um, maybe five uh, chocolate chip cookies. I take them, I drag and drop them into the browser. I say these are chocolate chip. They're getting uploaded. Then I take a couple of oatmeal raisin cookies. I mark those, drag and drop them into the browser, name this the raisin category. And now I just press upload and train. And basically, a couple of seconds later, I now have my own deep learning classifier. So literally, in the last five seconds, we just trained our own deep learning image classifier. And you can now use code uh, for you know, querying that. Or you can, again, uh, just take some images and drag and drop them into the browser and then uh, have it classified. And the first time you do that, we might load the classifier into RAM. And then uh, the faster you want it, um, you know, the, after you've used it for a while, um, it will basically uh, be um, you know, loaded into RAM and then uh, just a few milliseconds of classification uh, time. So here we see basically chocolate chip uh, was correctly classified. And we can look at you know, a raisin oatmeal cookie and uh, drag and drop that in here too. So of course, when you actually have very large data sets, you might not want to you know, drag and drop all of those into the browser. And uh, so what we also will support and actually launch, um, here we go, raisin uh, cookie. Um, next week, we'll actually launch an API that will then allow you to programmatically upload you know, thousands or tens of thousands or millions of images into, um, uh, into our system and train a classifier that way. Here's a very simple line of code. If you, you know, basically just say, you know, you set your API key, you say, I have some classification problem. Here's my classification data. It's of type images. In fact, the same could be true for text. You can also just drag and drop text files into the browser and train a uh, classifier that way. Now you can add samples in a variety of ways. You can use Dropbox links. Uh, you can you know, have a zip file. You can look at the folder structure inside on, on your computer. Or you can just uh, send it a couple of uh, URLs uh, that are online. You say what kind of model you have, a classification model. And you just say fit and then predict. And that's all there is to do. So basically, in you know, five minutes, uh, anybody here could train their own classifier. All you need to do is pip install uh, Metamind. And then you run the script I just showed you. Uh, you had to log in, of course, on the website before, so it knows uh, your ID. And now, uh, basically, just after a few seconds, you can classify and have a trained production-ready system um, that will classify anything you want and you really care about. And what I find exciting is that you know, this has already been done, launched last month. And I have to make sure to log out to not show you all the private classifiers. So let me just log out really quick. And now, you know, what, what's exciting to me is to see what people are actually doing uh, with this classifier and all the interesting use cases that come out and what really happens when you give deep learning technology into the hands of literally everybody, not just people who can program. Uh, so we have here some patent classifications of, you know, this is a data sheet versus uh, something written in a patent. We have plankton samples. We have uh, malaria blood samples versus non-malaria uh, blood samples that people classified. Uh, this did really well. Of course, you can't really expect 100% accuracy for all your different problems. Uh, we have people train fashion classifiers um, for different types of skirts. And you know, there's no data, um, no data set that I would know of that would have you know, five or six different types of skirts um, in it. Uh, you can now take this uh, system and basically go through all uh, you know, Instagram or Twitter images and try to find specific brands. And you know, if you 
are familiar with confusion matrices. You basically want the diagonal here to be very large. And despite only having had um, 2,000 images for 38 different classes or so, uh, the confusion matrix uh, is still quite uh, working, working very well, uh, or shows very good performance. All right. Um, with that, I want to conclude. Uh, basically, at, at MetaMind, our vision is to push the state of the art in AI. We think deep learning is the way to do that and then also make it broadly accessible. Thanks a lot.